Hello, and welcome to the first of the video lectures for the geodynamics course at the University of Helsinki. The topic for the series of video lectures that you'll view today is the kinematics of plate tectonics. And so we're going to be talking about describing the motion of tectonic plates. And uh, that's in contrast to talking about the physical processes that drive the plate motion, which would be referred to as the dynamics of plate tectonics. So we're just going to talk about describing how plates move um, in the first series of lectures. And we're going to start by taking a look in three relatively short lectures at the different types of plate boundaries. And most of this will be a review for, uh, for most of you, but just to kind of make sure that we all have the same kind of background. The goal for the lecture, or for this mini lecture, is really uh, quite simple. All we want to do is present the main features of a divergent plate margin. And as we know, uh, this is only one of three different types of um, plate boundaries. So we'll start by talking about divergent or accreting plate boundaries, where we're forming new plates and we have plates moving away from one another. Uh, and then we'll talk in the following lecture about convergent plate boundaries where two plates are moving together, uh, often in a subduction zone, and then we'll follow that up with a uh, lecture about transform margins. So here we have a cross-sectional view through a spreading center or a divergent plate margin in the middle of an ocean basin, and this is a figure out of the Turcotte and Schubert geodynamics textbook, and this shows you know, the main features of a uh, divergent plate boundary. And as we know, this is where we're forming new plates with a divergent motion, and you can see that here shown with the vector u on one side of the spreading ridge and a vector of equal magnitude and opposite direction on the other side that's showing us our plate are two plates that are forming above the spreading center and moving away from one another. The elevation of these spreading ridges, um, as you can see here, this is relatively high elevation. Their elevation is a result of thermal buoyancy, so we have upwelling of the asthenosphere beneath a spreading ridge, and this hot material that's moving up uh, results in relatively high elevation of the spreading ridge relative to the rest of the ocean basin surrounding it, and um, that's a very common feature of spreading ridges. You can see also here with these little vectors um, and the arrows drawn on here, the migration of partial melt up from within the asthenosphere into a magma chamber at the spreading ridge itself, and that's where we're forming our new oceanic crust, um, and we have the two plates moving apart one, from one another with oceanic crusts on typical thickness of something like six kilometers, and the mantle lithosphere beneath there that's gradually increasing in thickness as you move away from the spreading center because it's cooling down and um, some of that asthenospheric material is solidifying to be the lithosphere beneath the new oceanic crust. The rates of spreading are on the order of centimeters per year, as you well know. Typically something like four centimeters a year would be a Good number to have in your head for an average uh, spreading rate, and they do vary a bit. The Pacific um, spreading ridges in the Pacific are a bit faster than the Atlantic, for example, and we'll see that uh, actually in just a moment. Now, the process by which we're forming the new plate at this divergent plate boundary uh, is called decompression melting, and uh, you may already also be familiar with this. As we saw in the previous figure, we look over here at this uh, plot, we can follow a parcel of the asthenosphere as it's moving up beneath a spreading ridge. And so it's moving vertically upward. And within the asthenosphere, the temperature is fairly constant, nearly isothermal. And so we can assume that this little parcel of rock is basically not cooling as it moves up. And it will eventually hit a point where it crosses what's drawn on here as a line, and that is the solidus. Um, for the basaltic component of the material within that asthenosphere. And so that's the point where the basaltic component starts to melt and um, 
we have now partial melting that's going to then migrate, if it can, upward into the magma chamber that's uh, right at the spreading ridge. And we can actually, um, using a very simple linear solidus, make some predictions about where we might expect this partial melting to begin. And so this will be one of our first equations that we can play with a little bit. It's a very simple one. Um, the linear solidus in here, in this case, we're just going to plot temperature. We have 1500 degrees, which is just our constant that's going to be added to 0.12 times P, where P is going to be the pressure in megapascals. So that's where the linearity comes in. It's just a constant number in front of pressure, which is going to um, increase with depth. And so using this relationship, I just want to point out uh, two things quickly. One, as I've already mentioned, it's a simple uh, relationship. It's just a straight line. But secondly, it's not the line that's drawn on this figure. So just to avoid any confusion, um, you can easily convince yourself that this equation will not produce this line if you put in a value of zero for pressure, which would correspond to a depth of zero, and you see that the temperature you get is 1500, which would be somewhere over here. So obviously it's not the same line. Nonetheless, we can play with this equation a little bit, and uh, this is gonna be your first chance to kind of loosen up and, uh, and do a little bit of math. It's a geodynamics course, so you're gonna be playing with equations a little bit here. Uh, that's part of what we do. And so in this case, uh, we'll calculate the depth at which we expect partial melting of the asthenosphere to begin, and we can do that using this equation here, along with a couple additional values. One is the density of the asthenosphere, so that's 3,300 kilograms per cubic meter, and we'll assume the gravitational acceleration is 10 meters per square second, and we can assume a constant temperature um, here of 1,600 kelvins. And so the question for you then is, at what depth, why, does the asthenosphere begin to melt? And the key thing here is to, to note that the pressure is simply density times g times y. And so you can plug that in over here, and you can solve for the depth at which your asthenosphere begins to partially melt. So I'll allow you a moment here. You can go ahead and pause the video and uh, take a shot at it and unpause it when you're, uh, when you're finished. Okay, I hope that didn't um, give you too much trouble. And I hope that you come up with something about 25 kilometers depth. Um, if you did have difficulty in trying to figure out how to get there, or if you got something very different from that, please just make note of it and we can talk about this when we get together in class. Uh, I'd be happy to, um, to go over this example. All right, so we'll move on. Um, one of the things I want to mention here, we're not going to talk really about the dynamics of plate motions right now, but I will point out a few of the forces involved. In this case, if we're talking about divergent plate boundaries, the main force we're looking at here is the ridge push force, and that's what's going to drive the motion of the plate. Ridge push is basically a form of gravitational sliding, so the relatively high elevations of the oceanic lithosphere at the spreading ridge results in that high material basically wanting to slide down away from the spreading ridge. And so that's one of the things that drives the motion of the plates on the surface of the Earth. And um, that's the main kind of contribution to plate motion from a divergent plate boundary. There's not, you know, there's no kind of significant pressure from the magma chamber or something like that that's pushing the plates apart. Okay, the last thing we're going to look at here is the age of the oceanic crust. So we have a map here, and on the map in all the ocean basins, you can see contours of the age of the seafloor. And it tells us a couple interesting things. First off, we can see something interesting about the spreading ridges and the relative rates of spreading if we compare the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is shown here in the black line, to the spreading in the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. And what you can see here is that the zone of red that is close to the spreading ridge, that's the youngest material, is relatively narrow in the Atlantic compared to the Pacific where it's much wider. And so that tells you in the Pacific that the plate's moving apart uh, much more quickly than we see spreading in the 
mid-Atlantic. So that's something interesting to note. The other thing we can note here is the age of the oceanic seafloor. And probably many of you are already familiar with this, but if you look around at the map here, you're going to struggle to find anything much um, older than the sort of blue colors, like 180 to maybe 200 million years old. See a bit of it over here on the east coast of North America, over here in the farther west part of the Pacific Ocean, um, as well as along North Africa. Um, and that's the, you know, basically the oldest oceanic seafloor that we see um, in effect. Now we know the age of the Earth, of course, is much older, and so that tells us right away that we need another kind of plate boundary, someplace we must be getting rid of this older oceanic lithosphere. And of course, as we know, um, that's going to lead us into our discussion in the next MIDI lecture about convergent plate boundaries. So just a little preview of what's coming up. All right, so that's it about divergent plate boundaries for now. Your next task is to take the little quiz about this mini lecture. And as you'll come to see, the quizzes are short, the questions are not terribly difficult. Basically, I just want to see, did you watch the video and did you understand what you watched? And so I don't keep track of the scores and uh, at least not for individuals. I kind of look at what everyone has done. And the idea is that I can then see if there's a problem where everyone seems to have difficulty in understanding something from the lectures. It helps me know what we're going to have to prepare to discuss um, in class. So go ahead and take your quiz. It should take you a couple minutes and then you can move on to the next lecture. So I'll see you when we talk about convergent plate boundaries in the next one.